Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars broadcast 171 regarding a shooting at 1333 New Hampshire. See the man at that address for further information. That's all. Rolls and quits. <laughs> In the 
confusion, the woman with the gun escapes and felt without waiting for the doctor whom he had called to arrive, rushes Walters to the Georgia Street Receiving Hospital himself. From there, the police receive an account of the shooting, and Detectives Bain and Sheldon are sent immediately to investigate. Now, you people sit down. We want to ask you a few questions. Now, which one of you is George Ennis? I am. Now, you come with us while we look the place over. The rest of you stay here. This is the dining room, officer. She came in through that door over there and touched them. We were all sitting at a table. Now, wait a minute. Until... Wait a minute. What did she look like? She was tall, I think. What do you mean you think she was tall? Don't you know? Well, we, we were all so confused. I, I just got a glimpse of her. They couldn't get over by that door when she shot? Yes, that's the door she came to. There was Peggy was no pleasant experience. Does that door lead to the back door? Yes, it, it opens into a hall that runs to the back door. Uh, and where's the kitchen? It's through that door over there. Was anyone in it at the time of the shooting? No. The cook left as soon as she served the coffee. Uh, Sheldon, you better look around and see if you can find anything interesting while I ask Mr. Ennis a few more questions. See if you can find any stray slugs. There must be some around. Okay. Now, Ennis, you say you think this woman was tall. Is there anything else you noticed about her? How was she dressed? I... It, it seems to me that she was wearing a red dress. And I... I think she had a black hat on. Hey, you know, her voice sounded a lot like Shirley Neela. Shirley Neela? Who was that? She's a girl that Walters used to go around with. Oh, Walters used to go around with her. Uh-huh. Hey, this is turning out all right. Did you know her very well? Pretty well. They came up to the flat together quite frequently. Not recently, though. Not for quite a while. You know if he still sees it? No, I don't think so. At least I haven't seen her. No, I'm quite sure that they don't see one another anymore. They used to be together quite a lot, though. What did she look like? Well, she's tall. She has dark hair. She's quite good-looking. She used to be a model. Still is, I guess. Yeah, tall and dark, huh? Eh? You said the woman that shot Walters was tall. Was she dark? Why, I don't know. I would even swear that she was tall. I, I just got a glimpse of her. Hey, you man. see, if you can. Uh, she was sure wild. She's got slugs scattered all over the place. Looks like she's plenty nervous. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like she wasn't so smart, either. Say, Mr. Ennis, do you remember what Walters did when she broke in? No. No, I don't. Uh, we were also confused, and it happened so quick to you. But, well, it seems to me that she was looking at Jim all the time. It... Hey. Well, what? That, that's right. She didn't even glance at the rest of us. She was looking at Jim Walters all the time. He, he was sitting over there, and, and I was sitting like... <laughs> over the seeming simplicity of the case, Bain and Sheldon hurry back to headquarters and report their findings. Captain R.M. Davis, Detective Thad Brown, and the third officer go to the hospital where Walters, not fatally injured, is rested. Their pride in what they thought was such rapid progress is short-lived, however. But after a few short seconds with the man who's been shot... Well, Mr. Walters, it didn't take us long to find out who the woman was that shot you. What? Woman? Yeah, she was no friend of yours. You know Shirley Nealon, don't you? Uh, yes, I know her. Well, she's been in Denver for some time past. Well, she's the one who shot you. What? Why, you're crazy. She didn't shoot me. Yes, and I don't know who did. But no, I can tell you this much. You're off on the wrong foot, see. Shirley neither didn't have anything to do with it. Mulling over these developments, which have changed what seemed at first an open cut case against Shirley Nealon into a baffling example of diverse testimony, the three officers returned to headquarters to map out a plan of procedure. Learned that a 38 caliber slug from a Smith and Wesson gun has been removed from Walter's body. Proceed to his house on 103rd Street. Well, the address. Let's go. Back. 
Stick around. We'll be over at this address on 64th Street. Okay. We passed the drugstore down a couple of blocks. I'll go there. Come on. Let's have a look around there. Exactly. Come after anything. What do you mean? 
Well, she came in and asked to use the phone first. You know who she called? No. Did you talk to her after she made the call? No. She just came in and sat down and then jumped up and said she just remembered something. She had to get in the other apartment. What other apartment? This one? Yes. What did she do? Well, I heard her in here. And she went out to her car and she drove away. And you didn't talk to her anymore? Yes. She phoned about 11. What did she say? Do you remember? Yes. She said to tell her mother that she was all right and that she wouldn't be home, that she was staying at her girlfriend's house. Just if any of uh, people had been uh, about what, looking what, for her. Uh, what did you say? any people had been about looking for her. Now, that isn't what you started to say. What exactly did she say? I believe my sister said, have any cars been out there after me? Realizing after more questioning that they can gain no further information, the two officers leave the house on 64th Street. Return again to headquarters where they find welcome news. The men guarding Walter's home have taken into custody a woman in red. Tired as they are, they speed at once to the house. Find the woman seated comfortably in a chair, smoking, surrounded by officers. The wall clock reads just 4 a.m. That's all, boys. Ron, I will ask the lady a few questions. Now, uh, maybe you can tell us just what you were doing in Mr. Walter's house. I am Mrs. Walter. What? Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, will you? Aren't you Shirley Nealon? Yes. That is my professional name. And yet you say your name is Mrs. Walters. Mr. Walters and I were married in Yuma. Uh, did you know that Walters was shot tonight? Yes. How did you know? I called Mr. and Mrs. Apartment. He told me. It's not serious, is it? Yes. But he lived. He'll be in court to testify against you. Testify against me? Why, I didn't have anything to do with it. Tell us just what you did yesterday. Well, I, I slept until around noon. Then I went downtown to a dentist. The work had been done, I went to a theater. I wanted to kill some time. You see, I had a dinner engagement with Mr. Walters. After the theater, I called him. Did Mr. Walters meet you for dinner? No, he didn't. Hmm. Did you go to your stepfather's on 64th Street after you called him? No. Well, didn't you go there and take your stepfather's gun? Gun? Well, I didn't even know he had a gun. Yes, your stepfather has a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson pistol. Well... And that's the same kind of a gun that was used to shoot Walters. Well, I didn't know he had a gun. I didn't have anything to do with the rest of it. I wasn't even there when Mr. Walters was shot. Where were you? I was here. After I called Mr. Walters from downtown, I came here and waited for him. He didn't come, and I telephoned several people. I called Mr. Ennis's and asked if he was there. What did he say? He said that Mr. Walters wasn't there. That he expected him for dinner. Had Walters asked you to come to dinner? No. Maybe he didn't know that I was in town. You see, I've been away for some time. Yeah? He knew you were back. Well, I... then I don't know why he didn't ask me. How long did you stay here at the house? And I've been here ever since. I called Mr. Ennis again a little after nine. That's when I found out about the shooting. Now, you weren't here when we first came to the house. No. But your car was here. It had recently been running. The radiator was still warm. Where were you then? Well, I was in... The backyard. In the backyard? What are you doing in the backyard? You weren't hiding from anyone by any chance, were you? Yes, sir. As a matter of fact, I was. After I found out about Mr. Walters being shot, I, I went out of the house and started to back my car out of the driveway. And well, then I, I saw a car drive up, and I, I thought it was the police, and they think I had something to do with it. So I, I ran out into the backyard. Where were you in the backyard? I was hiding in the corner, the, behind the dog. How long did you stay there? Oh, I don't know. Maybe a half an hour. By that time, there were more officers around. Finally, I, I decided that I didn't have anything to be afraid of. So I walked in the back door, and that's when the police found me. Repeated questioning brings no results. Davis and Brown finally take the woman to the Central Homicide Office. Turn her over to Captain H. J. Wallace, whose expert questioning still fails to change her story. Realizing that they must have more physical evidence, the men wait for the sun to arrive, then go once more to Walter's house to search the ground. Beginning at the rear of the premises, they comb the backyard. Find nothing. Well, they crossed the backyard off our list. Yeah. Come on. Let's take a look at the back porch and then go through the house again. 
take that side, and I'll take this. Look everywhere. All right. She came over for dinner, and then we played bridge afterwards. She, my husband, and my brother, who was staying with us. Well, at about 11.30, she said that she thought that she had better go home, so I told her to the door. I turned on the porch light, and we stood on the porch talking all over for about five or ten minutes. And then I went over to look at a plant that I had sitting on the railing. And in the bushes at that end of the porch, I saw a woman crossing. I saw a woman crossing. Well, I screamed, and she ran across the street and jumped into a car. Then I called my husband, and when he came out, she jumped out of that car and ran down the street and jumped into another one and drove off. Do you notice what kind of a car it was that she drove away in? Well, I, I couldn't be sure, but well, it was a small car, though. Mm-hmm. It was a coupe. Ah, a small coupe, eh? Mm-hmm. Could it have been a Ford? Yes, it, it could have been. As a matter of fact, I think it was a Ford. Oh, it was awfully scary. I didn't sleep a wink all night. I tell you, officer, had I not been the type of woman that I am, things might have been very different. Why, people's hearts have stopped for less than that. From another woman who lives opposite the Ennis flat, they get more information. Well, I've been to a show, and as I was coming up the walk to our front porch, a woman calls me from the side of the house. She wanted me to call Mr. Ennis. I didn't see why she wanted me to call him. I should think that if she wanted him, she could go and call him herself. So I told her that Mr. Ennis had gone to bed. She asked me if I was sure, and I told her yes. I didn't know, of course. Well, just then a car came up to Mr. Ennis's place, and a lot of policemen got out. Then the woman ran into the backyard. <laughs> Armed with these additional facts, Davis and Brown, not entirely satisfied with Walter's story of the shooting, and hoping that these developments will induce him to alter his original version of the near tragedy, go again to the Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. Well, hello there. Yeah, how are you getting along? Hello, Walter. You know, we found a few things that sound important. And we think that maybe you'll change your mind about Shirley Nealon after you've heard them. Oh, no, you're all wrong about that. She didn't do it. We found her at your house early this morning. Had quite a talk with her. Well, she says she didn't do it, doesn't she? Yeah. But, Walter, we found the gun on your back porch. The gun? Well, how do you know it was the same gun? It was a thirty-eight caliber Smith & Wesson. That's the kind of a gun that was used on oh, you. no, no, you're all wrong. Oh, say, I have a gun like that, but the one you found must have been mine. What was it doing in a laundry bag on the back porch? <laughs> laundry bag? Yeah. That's where we found it. Oh. Oh, sure, yeah, I remember that. It was in my car, and I didn't want to take it away in the house, see? So I, I just put it in the laundry bag. Oh, that's funny. Miss Le- uh, Neelan's stepfather had a gun just like that, too. Only when he went to get it, it was gone. Oh, well, that doesn't mean anything. No, that doesn't mean anything. Only it's funny, because this Neelan woman of yours was seen at her stepfather's between the time he saw the gun at 6 o'clock and the time he looked for it about 2 this morning. Oh, well, that doesn't prove that she did it. Now, look, I know Shirley better than you do. And I said that she didn't do it. I don't know who did it. Acting like the accused, instead of a potential murder victim under the questioning, Walters claims stubbornly to his original contention. However, the testimony of the neighbors, her own dubious account of her movement, the gun and the Ford car, is enough evidence to bring Shirley Nealon to trial. On October 18th, 1935, she appears before Superior Judge Vickers in a hectic trial where Walters, on the side of the state, gives testimony obviously in favor of the defendant. But the jury, after 40 minutes of deliberation, announces a verdict of guilty as charged in the information. On November 1st, Judge Vickers sentences Charity Nealon. Charity Nealon. You've been found 
guilty as charged. Therefore, I sentence you to from one to twenty years of that to be prison. <laughs> been written in the strange drama when Shirley Neelan is taken to prison. For two months later, Jim Walters finds himself facing Judge Agler, not in the role of witness this time, but as defendant. Listens in spite of amazement as the court 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 sympathizes with the reason behind your testimony. However, there is a law that says a person found to be guilty of false evidence should be liable to a charge of perjury. Shirley Nealon has been found guilty of the charges against her, which can mean only one thing, that you, Jim Walter, have, for some strange, distorted sense of chivalry, perjured yourself in this court. Therefore, I sentence you to serve the term provided by law for such an offense, namely, from one to ten years in San Quentin Penitentiary. So it was that this strange man who chose to lie under oath rather than testify against his paramour found out too late the fact that the law cannot be trifled with. By perjuring himself as he did, Jim Walters played it. And although it is too late for him to learn a lesson from it, perhaps you who are listening will realize more fully the fact that the laws of the country were made to protect you. When you violate them, you are going out of your way to ask for just one thing, trouble. Thank you, Chief Davis. Coconino County, Arizona, the second largest county in the United States, 18,623 square miles in area. And the gasoline used in her sheriff's cars must give police car performance. So Coconino County becomes the latest addition to the ever-growing list of cities and counties specifying Rio Grande gasoline exclusively. Now you can get exactly the same gasoline as your nearest independent Rio Grande dealer. Try it tomorrow. Your independent Rio Grande dealer also has a particularly newsy issue of calling all cars news for you this week. Something for every member of the family. Pictures, movie and radio gossip galore. Get your copy tomorrow. And don't forget to ask next time for Sinclair Motor Oil. Sinclair Pennsylvania and Sinclair Opaline, the thoroughly de-waxed, de-jellied motor oils that you can use all year round without changing grades. See your Rio Grande dealer tomorrow. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. A cancellation broadcast 171 regarding the shooting. Suspect in this case is now in custody. That's all. So, who's the clip? Frederick Lindsley.